all the four again now? All four? Or just all three? Four. Yeah, all four. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is our third, fourth parent plug-in this year. Um, and at one point, we started asking our families to tell us, like, what do you want to know more about? We want this to be a good time for you. We can certainly share a lot of the things that are happening at the school, and we'll do that today. But also, what do you want to know more about? And one of the things that our families have pretty consistently said is, tell me more about how you're measuring the performance of my child, right? We put all of these metrics out there and folks just kind of want to know. So we're going to do a portion of our meeting today about that. But um, I kind of want to talk about why we started doing this. Um, I said early on that we've kind of gone through a disruptive wave in education where families don't generally just openly trust schools anymore. It's been that way for about probably the last 20 years, um, but then certainly during the pandemic and post-pandemic, when there was a huge break in the communication between families and families even being allowed to be in schools, we've kind of missed some opportunity to be connected to our family. So we decided um, to really look at ways that we can intentionally connect with you. The parent plug-in is one, of course we do newsletters, we do other things, we have meetings and conferences and we're gonna keep doing that, but we're always open to different ways of being connected to you and hearing from you about your perspective and how we can keep being better. So, some recent news. Um, we have not done any um, big push for fundraising in our school, um, really in the last four or five years, um, especially not related to a direct ask, um, which is just basically, hey, if you have value to what your child is getting here and you can support us fiscally, please do that. Um, so we put that out to community members, we put that out to parents, local businesses, um, and as you can see, um, our goal this year was 150,000, um, considering that we didn't have a goal at all last year, we thought that was pretty big. Um, we wanted to try to do that, and we're already at 105,000 um, right before the winter break. So we've had a lot of folks that um, have done some really great surprising in size donations to us, um, but it's also really good for us to be able to go out and talk to partners when we start thinking about grant opportunities, we start thinking about other things we want to accomplish. One of the first things that they talk about is, what's the culture of giving at your school? How do you know that you're supported financially? Um, and this is a way that we can demonstrate that. So we're very excited about that. Um, we're about 71% um, of our goal for this year, which considering we're only about 50% of the year done, um, we think it's doing pretty well. Um, we just received a growth strategy grant. Uh, we partnered with the Georgia Charter Schools Association out of Atlanta um, and were awarded the opportunity to do more work, which is a weird thing to get awarded, but uh, we were. Uh, and it aligned to the things that we were doing for our strategic planning um, anyway. So we are, we're looking at redefining and looking at what our strategic plan is for the next five years that hasn't been done for like the last seven years. So the timing of this was really great for us. Well, through our work with that group over the last three months, um, they said, hey, we really like what you guys are doing. Um, we appreciate the value of what is happening at your school. To continue this work, we're going to provide you a $50,000 grant that's reimbursable before the end of this year. So we were excited to get that information. We found out right before the winter break. Uh, staff is rested, so um, that's exciting. Uh, we just came back for our work day on Tuesday. Um, everyone was back except for two colleagues that are sick, but um, we are one of the few schools in the district that's 100% staff. Uh, we feel very fortunate that um, we don't have vacancies right now. I do have a custodial vacancy, but that's just because we decided to hire one, um, not because we had that sitting out for a while. We've already had somebody apply, so that's good. Um, so we are doing really well as far as staffing goes, and it was nice to have the staff return and you know, feel like they got some rest over the break. Um, one of the things too, so our teacher retention rate um, is right at around 7%, um, which means we keep about 93% of our colleagues each year. Um, that's a pretty incredible statistic when you think about that across the board in education, most schools lose about a fourth of their teachers every year. Um, so we still, even with people remarking, and folks in Atlanta have, folks locally have at the Savannah Chatham Board, um, said, wow, you guys do a great job retaining your teachers, your talent. Um, 
how do you do that? And we, we try to do that in a lot of different ways. Well, one of the things that the board approved this year is also the, the implementation of an incentive program so that we can provide bonuses for our colleagues and try to recognize them for the work that they are already doing. So uh, we partner with our colleagues to have them tell us, what do you think that incentive structure should look like? We have ideas, um, the, the executive team certainly has ways that we think that should work, but you're the ones doing the work, so how do you feel like that should look? And they decided that they wanted a three time disbursement this year for that incentive, and it gives them a chance to kind of reflect and demonstrate the work on the incentive program. So they got one third right before the holidays, they'll get another third before the spring break, and another third at the end of the year. Um, that's going really well, and folks I think we're excited. Um, people just tend to get excited to get more money, um, and so they were excited to have that opportunity. Um, and then our basketball season's in full swing, um, and uh, we're really just kind of leaning into sports this year with a lot of starting our new athletics program. So um, the winter sports tryouts are continuing, so basketball is going on. Next Tuesday, we have the beginning of soccer tryouts and soccer season for us. Um, and then the following Tuesday after that, which is the Tuesday after um, the Martin Luther King holiday, is baseball tryouts. Did I get that right, Coach? Thanks. Um, so we're excited about that. Uh, we're also excited to try to keep our kids healthy. Um, we had some kids come back from the winter break um, not completely whole. so. Uh, trying to talk to them about how important that is if they want to be in sports, like we need to keep them healthy. Um, Future Cities Project is something that we're really excited about. Uh, it's something that we did last year. Uh, there wasn't even a Future Cities protocol in the state of Georgia last year, and our kids participated, ended up traveling to North Carolina. It was so successful that it actually came back to the state of Georgia this year. And that's um, something where our seventh graders are designing Future Cities. It's all part of their environmental science research and the things that they're doing about designing new ways for people to live in new communities and so that future cities project is happening now with students going to atlanta to um, show off their work uh, later this month or february no, i think it's in february eighth grade high school tours hey, do i have any eighth grade parents in here All right, moving on. No, I'm kidding. Um, so one of the things with having eighth grade this year for the first time, we wanted to provide opportunities for our eighth grade families to really get connected to what the high school options are in the community. So we had a big high school fair. All of the high schools, um, both public and private in the area were invited. All of them showed up, save one. Uh, we're on social media, I won't tell you who it was. Um, but they all came out. Parents thought it was really great that um, they had an opportunity to connect with those schools and now we're following up with some school tours. So our eighth graders are going on school tours this week and next week at the high schools. Um, and the schools have been very excited to host those tours. Some parents are already making the decision about where they want their child to go, but this is another opportunity for them to have some experience and see what those school cultures are like. Sixth and seventh grade junior achievement program. I don't know if you guys are aware, but the but the JA Discovery Center um, in the back of the Georgia Southern campus here at Armstrong um, has opened. It's been open for a couple of years. It kind of happened during the pandemic, um, but they've got an amazing program where basically kids get to go and work in storefronts and work in those businesses for a day, learning more about finance, learning more about what the opportunities can be when they have to keep a budget, when they have to make financial decisions. So we're partnering with JA, sixth and seventh grade are doing that, uh, and uh, that's actually happening this month and through the rest of the year. Um, Student Success Expo, again, for those that are thinking about um, school choice options, especially high school options, um, the Student Success Expo is something that the school district hosts each year. Um, it's been at Savannah Mall year over year for probably about 15 years. Savannah Mall was sold, so it's not at Savannah Mall anymore, and they have an idea about where it might be, but we haven't been able to announce that yet, so we'll find out more information and share that. Uh, but it is a good chance to come out and see what's happening in schools in the community. I certainly hope you're happy here. We uh, sent out our uh, recommitment forms. We got a lot of those back immediately yesterday, uh, but it is a chance to see what's happening in other schools. And our next plug-in is going to be on February the 2nd. Uh, again, we're gonna host that here uh, right after drop-off in the mornings. 
uh, and uh, that's going to be on technology. Folks often ask, what are, what's my kid really doing with an iPad, and how can I be connected, and is this really the best way to do this, and how thoughtful are you guys with this technology, and all these great questions that we can actually defend and talk about, um, and hopefully help it make sense and help you help us continue to do a good job with this practice. Um, so I think that moves us right into MAP, uh, or the MAP assessment, which uh, Ms. Beck and Ms. Ingram, uh, they do a lot of things for our school. Ms. Beck is the Director of Curriculum Instruction, Ms. Ingram is our Director of Student Affairs, but one of the things that they share is test coordination and really helping us test our students and assess their learning and then give that information out. So they're gonna take a portion of this and talk and then I'll come back. And the um, Student Success Expo is at the Savannah Civic Center. Oh, it was, finally announced, yay, thank you. <laughs> Um, so I've given every, everyone should have a copy of mm -hmm. their students' MAP scores. Mm -hmm. yeah. You got your set. Did you yeah, get I didn't see them. Okay, perfect. Uh, we're going to go over that a little bit, but we're also going to provide, try to provide a little, <laughs> a little context. Oh, no, I think you can pull this up. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Sorry, here. I'll go um, we're going to provide a little context for what those scores mean because I think if you if you're not sure, it can seem a little abstract when you're starting to read these reports. You're like, okay, that's just a number that doesn't really tell me anything. So hopefully, we can help you kind of understand that a little bit more. Um, before we even get into any of those scores, I do want to say one of the things that we try to emphasize with our staff, with our students, is you know not too much test pressure here, but we are looking for growth, not achievement, um, because everybody every student starts on their own level, and we just want to see that they're making improvements. Um, and not necessarily comparing themselves to their peers. Can we talk about your assessment? Sure, you want to talk. So the MAP assessment is a computer adapt is an adaptive assessment. So what that basically means, it's trying to pinpoint <coughs> the student's level where they're performing. So how that works is they start out, um, if they've never taken it before, they might start out with a generic question that is um, kind of around what grade level that they are taking the test for and then depending on if they get that question correct or incorrect then the computer gives them their next question based on how they answered the first question and that continues so if they continue to get them correct 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 and maybe you know it's showing a, a pretty advanced level then it might give say a first grader I don't know some more advanced multiplication questions or something like that and it'll give them some advanced questions and then once they start get them wrong so it takes this window and it starts to narrow the window as the questions are getting harder and then easier and harder and easier and then they it's there's a really good graphic we should put that on there um but it it begins to narrow down based on their answers it kind of predicts uh where their their level is so it's not that every student is answering the exact same questions it's giving them questions based on their prior answers so it can more pinpoint um, an accurate ability or achievement level. So. Um, that also means the test isn't timed. Um, <coughs> it stops when it, we've hit that window. Mm -hmm. uh, for our younger students, that tends to be a shorter amount of time, but for mm -hmm. older students, it does tend to get a little bit longer and can, and can go into multiple sessions for testing. Yes, and even some, the, the number of questions that they actually answer could vary you know, about five questions or so. So not every student is answering the same amount of questions as well. Um, so the score that you're gonna, <laughs> you, that you receive, there's a big number on the top of that, that's uh, the RIT score, um, and that's their achievement level. That's not tied to a grade level. So it's not like this is the grade level that this RIT score is in. Um, it, this is a good description here. It's a stable scale like feet and inches and it just measures the student performance um, regardless of age, grades, or grade level. Um, there is some normative data on your report that we'll look at as well, but that's not what the actual RIT score is. Mm -hmm. So it's their own scale, okay. MAP's own scale. Um, so we give the test three times a year, uh, fall, winter, and spring. Our teachers use this information um, to group students for instruction, remediation, um, our students get the scores and this starts to be more of a narrative as their students get older as well talking about how they can how they can grow where they need um, to improve so we do try to put some ownership on students even at the, at the lower level students are aware of this and it's just a way to communicate and tell 
parts of the story of what your how your student is doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the report that all of you have in front of you. There's lots of reports that this produces. I'm sorry yours isn't in color, um, but this should give you an idea of what you're, you would be looking at. Um, you have two reports, one for reading and one for math. Um, they and are you're basically seeing this part, not yep. what's over there. Yeah, Yeah, you'll see, and then on the back, you'll see the chart. And I do like this chart because it gives two scores on there. Oops, sorry. <laughs> now that busted <laughs> through. <laughs> <laughs> it will give the score um, from their fall assessment and then it down here and then it might give you a second score which is their winter assessment but if it doesn't it's just because there wasn't enough space and that's the, that's the score for the winter assessment which is on the front page mm -hmm. but starting on the left this is where you actually get your comparative data here um, and that is where they are actually saying like where your child falls in relation to other children in that in that in their grade level so 50th percentile would be considered average right so your growth mean how much your kid your child grew from the last assessment they took the fall assessment to the winter assessment because that's all the data we have last year we took math I don't know if Mr. Old he didn't get into how he explained this part oh how we switched the Students who were here last year also took math. We took that under the district. Had, they also gave math, and so we were able to take that under their account. The, the district has stopped giving math, but we wanted to continue giving math and not change to iReady, which is what the district gave, um, gives now. So we had to change to our own account, and that data did not transfer. So the reason you don't see last year's math scores on those growth profiles is because of the change in account and student numbers and things like that. So we do still have a lot of that data, but it just doesn't show up on the, on the reports. Uh, this is, I think, <coughs> one of the, my favorite parts of the, the information that this gives is the quadrant chart, which you don't have the quadrant chart, but it tells you where they fall. Um, and so you'll see either low growth or low achievement or high growth or high achievement. Um, what we want to see, of course, is our students showing high growth and high achievement. Um, but oftentimes what you'll see is if maybe your student is below the um, 50th percentile, it'll say maybe low achievement, but high growth, that is a celebration. Mm -hmm. If we have a student who is maybe a little bit lower, but they're moving up really quickly, that's, that's awesome. That's what we love to see. Um, what you see oftentimes too is you'll see high achieving, low growth. That's because once you're at that really high achieving level, it tends to get a little more difficult for students to continue to improve. And the, the gap that you see between scores each time they test gets smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. But when you start out pretty low, it's easy to take a big jump, just to kind of help you understand what that, what that means. Right. Um, the next section, if you keep moving over and reading it, there is the instructional area. So you can see it breaks it down by domains. Um, for our lower students, there's, I think it's only K and one, that there is an, a foundational um, skills in reading, but the rest of them look the same. Um, and the foundational skills is just phonics and phonemic awareness. And then when you flip the page, because we don't do the growth goals, it just means there. When you turn, when you turn the page, there is um, the table there, and that's where you're gonna be able to see where your student started their second score for winter. And again, it might not show that se second score if they're too close together, um, but it's just the score that's on the front of the page. And then it's gonna compare it to at another, like nor the normative um, information, the norm student, the 50th percentile. Right, that's the that mm -hmm. Questions about the report. There's a lot of numbers on there, a lot of information, and we just kind of wanted to make it, give you some basics. Again, it's not the end all be all. So each at, after each assessment plan, these are available to parents. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. and yes. then, okay, so then um, say if the achievement or growth was low, would the teacher or would they be able to get some information on how to help the child out at home? 
Oh, so providing parents with information. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's something that I think when you when you sit down with the teacher for a conference mm -hmm. about this, mm -hmm. those are questions you can ask. Okay, so if, if I know my child's low in geometry, what kind of resources are there that I can help support them in that domain? Um, and absolutely, speak to your child's teacher, and they will give you the information and the support that you need to. The map doesn't really generate anything parent-facing. Okay. If that's yeah. what you were asking. You could also, like Khan Academy is a great resource if you did want to look at home. Like if you know your child's in second grade and they were low in geometry, for example, it has the Georgia standards it has baked a, into the platform. Khan Academy yeah. has uh, these, yeah, it has the yeah. domains baked in. You could actually look up, I mean, numbers and operations is huge. Um, so you could ask the teachers, hey, are there more specific skills that I need to work on to support numbers and operations? Um, and then you could go into Khan and they can mm -hmm. give you those resources and set students yeah. up in it. But that's a free web-based mm -hmm. resource that's great for okay. you know a little bit of remediation at home. It is not time. It depends on the grade level for sure because the younger students it tends to take 20 minutes. Probably. 20 to 30 minutes, I would say, and then I would generally guess uh, middle grades is taking about an hour. It, now, we have students that really take their time. They take it very seriously, and it does take longer. Um, and we try to break that up in the multiple sessions then. If that's the, case. The, the other cool thing that MAP does is we have, if you have a, a child that just doesn't really like testing and wants to not engage with this, and they start rapid guessing, it'll stop them mm -hmm. and notify the teacher if they're rapid guessing. So the teacher will go over there and say, hey, I need you to focus you know, take, or, or take a break. I mean, because this, is, this isn't, you know, a, a time test. So if you see that, a, if we see that a student is struggling to maybe stay focused on the test, or maybe they've just had it, they've been testing for an hour, we can stop the test, take a break, and come back mm -hmm. to it the next day. And you said that the district changed from... So the district gave MAP for years, mm -hmm. and then this year they switched to giving iReady through the district. What is it's another type of um, a normative test. It's similar. There's some other, I think what the district is, the real main reason they switched because there's a lot of other uh, supplemental activities that go with iReady on the computer that they web -based, like. Web-based learning. Yeah, yeah. Web -based they have learning. like gamified yes. remediation. So mm -hmm. like if, if a student's low and that same example, geometry, then they can spend time on the iPad doing right. geometry games and, and stuff. But you know, and as a team, we did evaluate that yeah. tool to see if that was something we wanted to adopt as well, and we thought it was more beneficial for us to be consistent with the right. way we're measuring our students. And to remediate within the framework of how we teach how anyway, we teach, yeah. instead of we don't do a lot of web-based learning. We don't put kids on computers and say, "Hey, we're going to learn this skill through this game." Because I'm looking at all of these. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and all of my children are different. Um, uh, but am I reading this correctly? Like when it says possible range, this possible range is going to be different for each child, right? Is that where you want them, like from a scoring standpoint, at the, kind of the top, uh, top left corner, under like whether it's mathematics or reading, you have the standard error area? Yeah, so it's probably that incorporating that standard deviation in that possible so range. So that you want to see them fall somewhere between that range or well, so, so possible range. Between. So this score is kind of where they they think with that adaptive sure. testing is where they think they fall. However, there's always some sort of error that they factor in sure. with the computer based testing. So the possible range is well, this is the score we think they're at, but they could potentially be a 200 through a 206. So they're kind of giving you that that standard deviation okay. and or, you know. Right, yeah. exactly, okay. yes. Because so. that's what I'm trying to figure out is when the score at the end, uh, where I need to be concerned, what, what areas I need to focus on. Oh, that was a little bit on the lower side versus, right. okay, yeah. for some reason. Here. So if you have, go ahead. We, we didn't mention one thing. For our third through eighth grade parents, they're on the left side there is a projections section. Um, and they, we did include that. Um, and that is the predictor for um, milestones, Georgia milestones, which we take at the end of the year. 
and the correlate between the MAP scores and the Georgia milestones is pretty accurate. Okay. And milestones, so MAP gives us a five level um, achievement measure, where so red, orange, yellow, green, blue, but milestones is broken up into four achievement levels. So <laughs> that helps you correlate that too. Because it's not the same as. So also on the bottom there's quantile measures and readability measures. What are those scores? Um, so a, a quantile to me is like kind of like a lexile measurement, right? Mm -hmm. So a lexile is another tool to see what level your child is reading at. So quantile is basically a lexile for math. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And then you'll see on the reading one, it doesn't say quantile, it says lexile. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you'll see text and books and things like that in libraries that are aligned to a lexile, a lexile level. level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can also just like Google books within that range if you're looking for stuff to kind of challenge or. Well, be know. careful with that though. Yeah. Um, there, I think I always feel like this is a really big challenge with looking at lexile levels with students who tend to be higher. Um, so you might have a second grader with a high lexile level, which puts them maybe at a fifth grade reading level. That does not mean they should be reading fifth right. grade level <laughs> content. It's just, so it's a challenge when you have really high readers to find content that is engaging and, and appropriate for their age, but also challenging yeah. at a reading level, um, which is something we talk about with teachers all the time. Remember, this is just one measure of how we look at students' performance. Uh, teachers do formative assessments, some of the assessments in their classroom all the time. Um, and we really do all of our goals as a staff when I talk to teachers and we set goals based on this data, it's all growth goals. We really want to see all of our students in its diverse population grow um, no matter where they start. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in April, um, there's a, about a week period the test will know that. And that's the test that the state uses to evaluate how schools are performing and where they are. It goes into our CCRPI score, all that stuff. This is more of an, in, the map is more internal. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they will take their final um, test in, I think middle grades will take it in March some point before the milestones test um, and then K2, they'll kind of have a, yeah, they'll take it more closer to the end of the year. April, possibly. Are these taken in the classroom? Just, yes. Okay. They're not individually taken outside? Um, unless your child has an accommodation that says they get individual or small group testing. But if that, if they do have that accommodation, then that's something that we, you know, we'll pull the students and have them take the test there. I just want to say I appreciate you taking the time to explain this stuff to me. Uh, my son goes to private school, and none of the teachers there give you any of this information. So I just really appreciate your time. Thank you. Is Mr. Ulrich still here? Uh, this is. Oh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> this is the next slide. Here, here we go. I'll, I'll run and just see real quick. You want to speak to her? You um, sure, I could take it. Yeah, I'll go to you. Yeah, see if you can find them. Well, you know, let me break out some of the things that the kids that like, if how the growth changes as they get older. Mm -hmm. Timothy and Emma's mom, they did tell me that even if it was only a little, that was good. Mm -hmm. So, like, she made it very clear because I noticed that, like, her, her testing was a little bit different from, like, you know, earlier in the year or last year. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And it does, you know, the test does account for like a summer slide. Um, yeah, they've done a lot of research. They new norms come out. I think the most recent norms are 2020 norms. It probably says it on there. Um, but I know they're already like doing research for about every five years. The new norms come out three to three to five years. Yes. Yeah. If you actually, if you turn it over and you look at that um, national average. You can see where it dips. That that is where they factor it. So. Sorry, I missed the rest of that conversation about data. I apologize. There's something going on on campus. Um, 
if anything, one of the things that I hope resonated is that we really try to be purposeful with the data that we gather, right? Um, schools have done horrible things to teachers over data and to families over data for a couple of generations now. We just haven't done a good job communicating it. We talk about high stakes. We do all of these things when really, like it's a snapshot of information that we should be able to try to gather and make decisions on, right? Are they decisions forever? No, they're not. But it might be what kids need in that moment for us to help them go beyond wherever they are. So I think that was generally what was being communicated, but we try to take a pretty common sense approach to the numbers that we get and also try to be transparent about that. So one of the things that we talked about when we were creating our school calendar last year for this school year is the opportunity that extended intercessions could provide for us to do re remediation services. Uh, we don't do summer school typically here. Um, island traffic over the summer, no transportation, like all of the things that make it challenging to do that. So we have tried to think what could be opportunities that we could provide services and support for kids that are really struggling. Now, as amazing and successful as Tima is, you might be surprised to know we have kids that struggle. We do. Um, they're not reading at the proficiency level that they need to be, or they're not calculating and computing mathematically at the level that they need to be for proficiency. So we need to be able to support that. So um, one of the things that we did, we wanted to do one in the fall, uh, with that first fall break that we had, um, but we really honestly were just getting back into and creating what this environment and culture would be with the new calendar. So we didn't have a lot of buy-in from teachers to say, absolutely, like sign me up for an extra week of work. Um, so instead, we turned all of our focus to getting this winter assessment data so that we would have the beginning of the year data and the middle of the year data, and then making some decisions about how we could support our students for the rest of the year. So after looking at the data, talking with the teachers, um, we actually got an overwhelming response from our colleagues saying, I wanna sign up to come in and help and help our kids be more successful during one of our spring intercessions. So I think you guys know we have two in the spring. We have one uh, that is actually March 13th through 16th, and then there's another one a couple of weeks later that aligns to the Savannah Chatham. Um, we're going to use that first intercession to target specifically students that we know can benefit from some extra support and that that will help them maybe move into areas of proficiency that they're not at right now. Um, we've looked at the data, we've talked about that. We're gonna be sending that information out to families by the end of January. If you don't receive it, then you're probably not invited. Um, that means that uh, you know we are not going to be able to host and service the entire school, right? Um, we're really looking very specifically in each grade level at students that need that extra support that are going to help them. Um, and we're really gonna be monitoring that performance from our students and see how they're doing as an outcome of that so that we can design that program better, maybe even more efficiently in the future. And if we can, offer more opportunities for that. Questions? What did I leave out? We're currently second through eighth grade? Yeah, second through eighth grade. Um, and did you mention transportation? No. Okay, yeah, no, there won't be transportation, unfortunately. Right. So it would be up to the families to provide that. It is going to be mostly a whole school day. We, we talked about that. Um, and because that it's happening during that week where we're not in school, but Savannah Chatham is, we'll still be able to provide breakfast and lunch for students. So again, being really thoughtful about what that looks like to have a campus that's kind of open for a small number of kids and still trying to serve them. Any other questions? Those were thanks back for those remind those guardrails of what we decided. <laughs> Speaking of calendar. There's been a lot of discussion on uh, social media. Um, I've actually only received two emails from parents. I'm not soliciting them, by the way. Um, but I've gotten one like super concerned email and I've gotten like one super positive email. So balancing out. 
This is basically the same calendar we have this year. Um, last year, I presented two calendars. I presented what we called a transition calendar to a more balanced approach. Um, and then I actually put forth a, what a lot of people call a year round or a balanced calendar mm -hmm. for this coming school year and hit the brakes on that. Um, even though I actually about the same got as much positive as I did concerning feedback, I pulled this year's calendar, um, sorry, that second year calendar from consideration and just asked the board to vote on our current school year, which they did. So, one of the things that we got as feedback from parents is, like, we really want to be more involved in this process for the calendar. No problem. Ms. Solomon hosted, I will say countless, but not, you can count them, right? There yeah. were like four? It was three with parents and three with teachers. Right, yeah. three parent meetings and three teacher meetings to discuss the calendar. Then, after we took all of that information and all of that feedback, we put the proposed calendar in front of our colleagues and said, hey, based on the feedback, this is the calendar that was created. Is this still the calendar that you want? Overwhelmingly, I mean, we actually surveyed and I think it was like 80% of the staff supported this version of the calendar. So this is the calendar that we took to the board in December? Yes, no, yeah. November. November. But they didn't meet in December. Because we didn't meet in December, thank you. So in November, we took this in front of the board. Um, I've gotten parent feedback uh, that has said, you know, well, we're worried about the, the staff. The staff want this, so we're good. Um, we're worried about opportunities for remediation for summer school. We've already talked about we don't really do summer school. And by the way, that's not a new thing with me. Tima has just never really done summer school. In the past, there were some opportunities for kids to get summer support, um, but it never really looked like anything on campus. As a matter of fact, I know for a fact that um, one of our colleagues went to Bull Street Library and met some kids and did some summer school stuff, but it, it's never really looked like a traditional summer school here at Tima. So we we're trying to look for opportunities for remediation. That's why we're doing the intercession thing that we're starting um, this spring. <coughs> so we have really tried to be thoughtful with this. The, I think the thing that really freaked everybody out, and I don't know why, um, but we're starting in July. Whoa. <laughs> it's three days, literally. Like, we started Monday um, this year in August. It was the first Monday in August. It was August 1st. August 1st. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> it was August 1st. <laughs> that happens to be the first Monday. We got feedback from families and we got feedback from colleagues that were like, hey, our kindergartners, our first graders, that, that week was long. It was hard for them to come back to school and go five days. Anybody have a K or one student right now? Uh, they were kind of tired. Teachers. Teachers too, but, <laughs> but really, but like the kids, like it, it was like they were exhausted by Thursday or Friday. So the conversation started, well, what if we didn't go a whole week that first week? Great. So then we start talking about opportunities to conference with parents, things that we know that parents want. We wanted to look at those ways that we can connect with families. Also look at ways that we can still build in these very logical breaks. Ta-da! I mean, this is the calendar with all of those considerations. I will also say that this is my 20th, 21st year, I think, in education. Nobody absolutely 100% loves every single calendar that comes out. It just doesn't happen, right? We do the best that we can with the 364.25 days every year that we have. Ta-da, this is it. So um, there is still an opportunity for public discussion and feedback at the board meeting that's happening on January 23rd. If you feel compelled to come and speak to the board, I am giving them the communications that I'm receiving from families. So if you don't want to talk to the board, but you do want to send me an email, I'm happy to send that on. You can also email the board directly. I don't ever um, expect that you have to go through me to talk to a board member. But um, this is what was presented, 
And so far, as I've said, I've legitimately, from all of the things that I know are happening on social media, but I don't really respond to social media, um, I've gotten two parent communications, one super positive, one with some concerns. So I wanted to give another opportunity to talk about it if you wanted to. Yes. <laughs> so we get empathy for that. <laughs> Thanks. I, I mean, it really is. Uh, we, to be responsive and to take feedback and create something that meets our needs and also respects what our families need is really challenging. Um, I, I do want to take an opportunity to say that I, I think Laura's work has been phenomenal on this and I'm grateful for the families and the staff members that have dedicated to what's always a contentious issue, right? Um, but I think the work speaks for itself and it's, it's really well done. Next slide. So, um, I don't know if I had a chance to talk to you guys about this. Um, when you work in an environment where uh, people are really passionate about what they do, um, they have the tendency to take that passion out on each other um, and not always in the most positive ways. Um, we care a lot about kids. And we care a lot about making sure we get it right, um, which means that we sometimes come into conflict. And so um, we have a really different faculty meeting model where colleagues come in and we have a little bit of open house type of you know housekeeping things where we're talking about visits and things like that but then we transition to them going to conference presentations from each other about things that they're excited about like <coughs> new ways that they can um, teach reading teach math ways that they can incorporate art into their instruction all of those things right so um, we have those conference sessions then we come back, they have a chance to talk to each other. Good morning, everyone, thank you. Um, and, then they, and then we're done, like that's the end of our faculty meeting. Well, the problem with that, although people can be really excited about hearing from each other, the problem is we're not really giving people a chance to vent. And so um, we have one session every quarter during that conference rotation called Disco Inferno which basically means if you wanna come in and start a dumpster fire over whatever you're worried about at work, you can do that. Um, I don't go to that session because sometimes people just don't wanna to talk to the boss. Um, I sacrifice Allie or Noel and they have to go in and listen to it. Um, and I do that for a couple of reasons. One, I want my colleagues to know that I trust my colleagues to take care of whatever their concerns are, right? But if they can't for whatever reason solve that, then they can come to me and we can figure it out together. So it's a really nice, very transparent way. Like everybody knows why people go to Disco Inferno. Everybody knows that they're going to complain and that's okay. You need a place to vent in your work culture. Well, I think parents need that too. So this is your chance. If there is something that's concerning you, something that you wanna complain about, Allie and Noel can help you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, like, I am more than happy to listen to what your concerns are. We may not solve it right in this moment, but I do want you to feel like you have an avenue to voice concerns that we can be mindful of and try to do something about. Um, ideas only get better when you share them. Schools only get better when people are talking about what's happening at school. So I'm, I'm open to that and I'm gonna set a timer for 14 seconds. No, I'm just kidding, you guys let me know. <laughs> any thoughts, any concerns? You can also share something happy, although people don't generally go to Disco Inferno for that. Yes. So, we have a sophomore in our program, so when we get like a new like, sophomore teacher, like, yes. how do you like merge them into the culture that we're in here? Because like, I know there's a lot of potential learning curve with the technology that we use mm -hmm. and coming from a high level position. So, how do, how do they fit in the current culture? So, for the folks watching online that maybe couldn't hear the question, the, the question is, when we get new teachers, um, like if we're reconstituting a grade level or we're just onboarding new colleagues, what does that look like and how do we help prevent that turnover, right? 
Um, how do we help them feel more like they're a part of? Because generally, if someone's coming from another environment, they haven't maybe been in a school or an education environment that's quite like this. Um, I'm not kidding. Ali is probably the best to talk about this um, in the sense that we create a whole onboarding program and we work that together. We invite new hires in about two weeks before other colleagues come back and we meet with them and um, we put them through an improv course with our community partners that do improv. We call the graphic recording artist to come in and teach them about graphic recording and why it's important for kids to be able to draw out an answer and not necessarily respond in writing, right? So there's a lot of things that we do and we kind of talk about what our values are, um, what it means to educate in a problem-based learning environment, um, how we really embrace people that um, are not risk averse, like they'll take risks, um, keeping kids safe, obviously, but if you want to be a dynamic educator, and everybody's had one, like if you've ever gone through school, you've had a teacher that you can immediately think of that like changed something about the way that you felt about school. If you want to be that type of educator, we really try to lean into what are the ways that we can help you do that? How can we help you be that successful, be that educator that you've always envisioned yourself to be? I want this to be a teacher's dream job with high expectations, right? Expectations from me, expectations from each other. Like our, our colleagues really have a lot of high expectations for each other too and we try to acclimate them to an environment where everybody cares about what everybody else does. And then also the expectations from parents and the expectations from kids. Your kids want to get the best. They want to be successful. So what does it look like cultivating that day over day? And Allie and I spend a lot of time with new colleagues and then not only during that new teacher orientation, but then throughout the year we do check-ins. We follow through with them. We see how things are going professionally, sometimes personally. You know, what's this drive like for you? You know, all of those things that we have to be mindful of when someone's coming to a new environment. Um, if someone is talking about some concerns that they have in their work, we begin having those potential exit interviews with them pretty early on. What would it take for you to feel like you're being successful here? How can we continue to provide support for you so that you can continue to be who you envisioned when you took the job here, right? All of those things. Um, I think that's kind of a big part of it. Allie, have I left anything out? Uh, there's teacher mentorship as well. Yeah. So if you're a new teacher here, you're assigned a mentor teacher um, that is paired with you to support you. But the other thing I think even before we do the teacher onboarding, it speaks to our um, interview process. <laughs> and there will be a parent plug-in specifically about how we hire new teachers, because that's a core part of how you create a culture. Yeah. I mean, we, we, look for, we look for staff members and teachers that we know um, will buy, you know, buy into our culture here and, and what we believe in. One of the most so we start out pretty. We start out pretty. Yeah, good. yeah, we do. One of the most uncomfortable things that we ask a new candidate is, "Tell us about the last time um, someone at work was mad at you." Well, first of all, it's a truth to power question, right? Like they have to tell a potential boss that someone gets mad at them, and we really pay attention. And most everybody changes that. They're like, "Well, no one's ever been cross with me. No one's ever been angry." Like they won't say mad, but. If they can admit that, what I'm really looking for is apology and forgiveness, and not that the other person did. I mean, we'll have candidates say, they got mad at me, but they got over it. Well, there's no ownership or responsibility there. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Right? I know you are. Um, <laughs> uh, that's not what we're looking for. We've already talked about this opportunity that people have to complain at work. And the reason that we do that is because people are passionate about what they do. If you don't think you're gonna work in a place where you're passionate and you're gonna need forgiveness, you don't need to work here. We're pretty clear about that. So yeah, I mean, Allie and Noel are right. Like we start during the interview and that process kicks off this whole thing. We don't always get it right. I'm first to say that, but by and large, and I've done this training across the state. Using this method and supporting teachers, it, you really do get 
high quality educators that are invested in that school community pretty quick. And then you just have to cultivate that. It's a good question. So where do I find that information? Because I could do that in my business. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we asked probably 14 questions and maybe only five or six of them are education. There are a lot of behavior-based questions and working in an environment where you have to take risks and working in an environment where um, you have to build collaboration and community in your classroom, right? Like we talk a lot about the kids working on projects together and folks are like, well, how do you do that? Well, you have to have adults that are willing to be engaged in that and model that also. Our students walk by the office that we all use, that they call my office, but I'm never in there by myself. And I'm okay with that because what they see is adults sit down and work on problems together every single day. So it's not a big ask for us to get them to do that in the classroom. It's not foreign to them. They see that with the adults. They'll walk into a classroom and see four adults planning something that don't have anything to do with each other, according to them, but then they'll go in the class and they're like, oh, we're doing that in social studies. Yeah, that's it, not magic. Like, we, we <laughs> planned on that. But for the kids, like, it's, they're like, oh, yeah, I see how you guys talk to each other and figure it out. Any other questions, concerns, comments, thoughts? Okay. That's, it. That's, That's the last all. Slide. Yeah. Oh no. Sorry. Wasteful again. Oh. Uh, but I clearly did not update this one. Wow. <laughs> it's January. You these. January twenty third. They were great. <laughs> um, we're a little so, rusty in the new year. So there is. So there is definitely a board meeting happening on Monday, January twenty third, uh, which is always a great way to plug in. Even if you don't want to give public comment, it's a great thing to just come and watch um, our board really look at the financials, look at the operations, looking at all of those things. There's a lot of data and information that's given there that sometimes you guys don't automatically see, but it's really good to go and get that information. And we are testing out live stream this, this month as well. So for be the on the lookout for that yeah. with my advanced production abilities. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, you're doing so good. <laughs> it's so good. good. <laughs> Growing and learning. <laughs> um, folks, thank you for your time. I know mornings are pretty pressing for a lot of you with work and other obligations. So any time that you give to us is precious, but I'm really, really glad that you guys could come in today. Um, if you have other questions about the performance of your child or how things are going here at school, please always reach out to us. Um, I'm happy to um, reconnect with you or at least connect you with someone that can help you more, you know, or at least faster than I can. But thank you so much for being here and Happy New Year. Thank you.